Hey everybody, Ryan here. Welcome to this video on the basics of dental x-rays. So whether you're going into the workforce as a dental professional, or you're interested in pursuing dentistry, or maybe you're a patient who wants to better understand how dental x-rays work. Well, this video is designed to give you a basic understanding of how dental x-rays or radiographs work and how to read them. So sit back and relax as we dive into the world of dental x-rays. First, let's start with a big picture, 30,000 foot view of how x-rays work and produce images. So we have a high voltage power supply that powers up the x-ray unit. Inside the x-ray tube or tube head, we have a filament. The filament is heated up and electrons shoot off and contact a tungsten target that then produces the x-rays. So essentially we have electricity, which turns to heat, which turns into electrons, which turns into x-rays. Now x-rays are high frequency, high energy waves. They're between ultraviolet radiation and gamma rays on the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's helpful to think of x-rays as similar in some respects to visible light in that they are packaged into these particles called photons. So x-ray photons are produced by the x-ray tube and scattered and absorbed by human tissue. Attenuation of the x-ray beam refers to how the x-ray beam weakens as it travels through matter. The thicker and heavier mass tissue there is, the less x-ray photons will actually make it through to the other side. And on the other side is what we call a receptor. Traditionally, it's a sheet of film that we would process in various chemicals. Now there are vinyl film packets that can be processed by a scanner and also direct digital sensors that can process the image directly to a computer. So let's put it all together. We have electricity, which turns into heat, which becomes electrons, which becomes x-rays. They shoot out of the x-ray tube and are attenuated through patient tissues and x-ray photons finally strike a receptor that is processed to create the x-ray image that we observe and analyze. Pretty cool, right? So there are two main types of dental x-rays. Intraoral x-rays are taken with the receptor in the patient's mouth. They're best for evaluating teeth and the supporting structures. Extraoral x-rays are taken with the receptor outside of the patient's mouth and are best for evaluating the skull and the jaws, as well as a bigger picture view of the teeth. In the scope of this video, we're going to focus primarily on the first two intraoral images, which are also the two most common images taken routinely at a dental office. So the bite wing image is so-called a bite wing because you bite down on a wing shaped device that holds the receptor between your upper and your lower teeth. So this is a diagram showing the tube head and the receptor, which is actually being held behind the teeth here between the upper and the lower teeth. So bite wing x-rays are commonly taken during routine dental visits and are really good at showing two things, cavities starting to develop on your teeth, particularly between them, and bone loss due to gum disease. These are mostly taken between the back teeth on either side of your mouth. So different gray values on an x-ray are determined in part by the settings of the x-ray unit, so exposure time, tube potential, tube current, and other settings, but we're going to focus on different gray values that are due to differential attenuation. That is, some tissues are thicker and more dense than other tissues, and those tissues that are more dense appear radiopaque or whiter because less x-ray photons make it through to the receptor. 
On the other hand, tissues that are less dense appear radiolucent or darker because more x-ray photons are able to make it to the receptor on the other side. So let's look at another bite wing close up. Now this image has some accentuated contrast, but it's helpful to distinguish between the different tissues. So in this bite wing, we can appreciate a lot of normal healthy tissue. So let's first focus on this brightest layer, which is the enamel layer. It's the most radiopaque tissue in this image because it's the hardest and most calcified, most dense tissue of a tooth. So we can see the enamel here, here, and on each of these teeth on the top and the bottom. Next, we have the dentin, which is the second hardest and most dense tissue of the tooth. It's a little more gray, it's not quite as radiopaque, but it's still relatively radiopaque in terms of everything we can see on the bite wing image. Next, we have the pulp, which is the least dense part of the tooth. This is where you have the nerve and the blood vessels that supply the tooth. And it's the darkest tissue, again, because it's the least dense part of the tooth. So all of these canals running through the middle of the root up into around the center of the clinical crown is part of the pulp tissue. The gums are actually very hard to see in this image. We'll see them a little bit later, but they'd be somewhere at around this level. It's a very subtle gray, not quite as dark as everything in between the teeth, but it would be somewhere in this general vicinity running through here. Next, we have the bone, which is a little bit easier to see, and it's underneath the gum tissue. And you can appreciate how it's a little bit whiter near the borders where it contacts the teeth. And this area is called the lamina dura. And this is because the bone tissue is a little more dense in these areas where it contacts the teeth and also at the borders. Inside, it's a little bit more porous and that's referred to as the medullary bone. The last thing I'll talk about here is the periodontal ligament, which is a very thin dark space that is between the lamina dura of the bone and the cementum or the dentin layer of the root. So the periodontal ligament or the PDL is this very thin ligament that holds the tooth and the bone together. And lastly, all of this really dark black area is actually just air. It's all the space between the teeth, and it's black because x-rays can penetrate through to the receptor essentially unhindered and unattenuated. It really only has to travel through your cheek tissue or your lip tissue, the soft tissues of the face, in order to reach the receptor. Now, when bacteria start to secrete acid that eats away at the mineral content of enamel, the caries or cavity process begins. And x-rays are so incredibly useful because a cavity manifests as a radiolucency because some of the mineral has been lost from that part of the tooth. And so more x-rays can penetrate it and reach the receptor. And in fact, this area right here of this upper molar looks suspect for a possible cavity. And we can confirm clinically whether that's just an anomaly or in fact a cavitated lesion. So let's revisit the first bite wing I showed you. So here again is the enamel layer. This is about a more normal contrast image. And then the dentin layer underneath and the pulp here. You can see maybe a little bit better the gum tissue coming through around here, and then the bone at the bottom running across here. So there are a couple things going on here that I wanted to talk about really quickly. 
the bone level is actually pretty low here. It's a lot lower than normal. So in other words, there's a significant amount of bone loss, and this patient has, or had in the past, gum disease. There's also a dark spot between the roots of this molar, a radiolucency in what we would call the bifurcation area, which is a sign of active infection of bone loss or gum disease. Now you might notice these white blocks that stand out, and they're actually more radiopaque than the enamel layer. These are actually silver amalgam fillings, and they reflect the majority of x-rays because of their metal composition, and so they appear very white on the x-ray image, as very few photons can uh, make it past this filling material. This amount of darkness at the border of the enamel and the root surface is actually uh, normal, and we call it cervical burnout. It's not representative of cavities, but it's more representative of a concavity of the tooth that's natural anatomy. Now, maybe if we look really closely, there might be a really tiny cavity starting to form over here on this tooth, but since it's so small, we would simply watch or monitor something like this while alerting the patient, making sure they're keeping this area consistently clean, following a diet that is not favorable for cavities, and so on in our preventive dentistry protocol. All right, so that's enough about bite wings. Let's talk about the periapical. It's called a periapical x-ray because it captures the area around, which is what peri translates to, around the tip of the root of the tooth which is also called the apex. So that's how it gets its name. The x-ray tube is oriented a little bit more angularly and the receptor is placed in order to capture the roots of the teeth. You can take these x-rays in for the front teeth or for the back teeth. They're typically taken vertically in the anterior region and the film is, or the film packet or re digital receptor is oriented horizontally in the posterior region. Periapical x-rays are also commonly taken during routine dental visits and are used to diagnose an abscess or maybe a cyst which can occur around the roots of the teeth and also any pathology or disease in the surrounding bone. However, they can also show cavities and bone loss just as we saw in the bite wings with potentially a little less accuracy. So here we see a posterior x-ray, a posterior periapical x-ray, and the important thing with these is to be able to capture the full anatomy of the roots of the teeth. You should be able to see the entire root and the apex of each of these roots. And so we could see the same thing in this image as well. So again, here you can see the enamel layer. You can see some more silver amalgam fillings in all of these teeth, the dentin layer, the pulp, the gum tissue, and the bone. And here is actually one of the maxillary sinuses above the roots of the teeth. So here in this periapical, we can actually see a small triangular radiolucency forming on the side of this tooth. And this is something that would be near impossible to see clinically because, well, it's between two teeth. And so for this reason, dental x-rays are invaluable for diagnosing cavities, especially early on. You can also appreciate a fairly large cavity forming over here that's penetrated through the enamel layer into the less dense dentin layer. Now in this uh, anterior periapical, we can see a small triangular radiopacity at the junction between the enamel and the root. And the root is aligned by a thin layer of cementum and then dentin underneath that. And so we call in, I believe in the first video I did on basic dental terminology, I talked about the CEJ, 
which is the cemento enamel junction. That's where the enamel and the cementum layers meet. And so typically in this area, if a patient has a lot of tartar buildup, this is where we would see calculus. And so calculus is represented by this little fleck here, and it's mineralized dental plaque. And so the reason why it's showing up as a radiopacity is because it's got some mineral contents in it. And so it attenuates some x-rays and shows up a little bit radiopaque. So that patient would be in need of a deep cleaning. All right, so here in this periapical, we see a couple of things going on. We see two extremely radiopaque structures here and here, and these are actually crowns. They're porcelain fused to metal crowns, or PFM crowns, where this extremely radiopaque area is the metal substructure, and the, the little bit less radiopaque area above that is the ceramic outer layer that we can see. And here we see a really big cavity that's invaded way into the enamel, into the dentin, all the way through to the pulp. And it caused infection in the bone, manifesting as this radiolucency. Now, if you put a routine collection of bite wings and periapicals together, you get a full mouth series. And the full mouth series collectively captures every tooth, every root, and every contact point between each tooth. All right, so we have a couple other x-rays I'll just briefly mention. We have the occlusal x-ray, where the x-ray beam comes from either above or below the teeth. And it's good to look for tooth or bone fractures from trauma, eruption patterns, and other things. The panoramic x-ray is an extraoral x-ray, and it allows for a frontal view of all the teeth with the patient's right side on the left and their left side on the right. It's great for looking at jaw pathology, developing and missing teeth, evaluating wisdom teeth, and many other big picture things that intraoral radiographs just cannot capture. Here is a cephalometric. It's also an extraoral x-ray, and the patient is looking to the right here with the skull, the upper jaw, and the lower jaw clearly visible. It's useful for evaluating the relationship of the upper and lower jaws to each other and to the cranial base. It's useful for tracking growth and particularly important in orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is something called the buccal object rule. I'll admit this is a bit more complicated and involved than everything else we talked about, but object localization is an important concept and I wanted to demystify and simplify it a bit in this video. So a dental x-ray is a 2D image of a 3D object, which means it has some inherent limitations, mainly that we don't have any sense of depth. But if you take two images of the same spot at slightly different angles, you can gain this sense of depth. You can gleam where an object is, maybe an impacted tooth, or a certain root canal, whether it's located to the buccal, towards the cheek, or lingual, towards the tongue. Now the buccal object rule is also known as the slob rule, which stands for same lingual opposite buccal, and I'll get to that in a moment. So the best way to visualize this rule is to hold up a peace sign in front of your face with your fingers just like this. So that we're all on the same page, I'll refer to this as the index finger and this as the middle finger. So do this along with me. You'll hold up the peace sign and now rotate your hand so that your index finger and your middle finger are in line with one another. 
So your index finger blocks your middle finger from your view. And you can squint one eye if that helps with this part. Now keep your hand exactly how it is, keep one eye closed, and move your head slightly to the right so you can see your middle finger peeking out from behind your index finger. Notice that as you move your head to the right, the middle finger appears to move along with you to the right. The same thing happens if you move your head to the left. The middle finger appears to move left in the direction of your head. And this is essentially the buccal object rule. As you move the x-ray tube head in one direction, the object that's further away from the tube head, more lingual, moves in the same direction. In other words, the lingual object moves in the same direction while the buccal object moves in the opposite direction. So let's see how that plays out in a real life radiograph example. So let's say we had only this image to the left and we wanted to know which root canal is buccal and which one is lingual. Well, frankly, we have no idea just looking at this one image. But if we take a second image at a slightly different angle, now we have all we need to determine that information. So the left image is a canine premolar periapical. The right image is a lateral incisor canine image. So all we really have to do is determine which direction we moved the two head the tube head from, from this image to this image. So let's convert this to a diagram to help. So this is another way to visualize essentially what we were just looking at. The two canals are right up against each other in the left image, and then we move the tube head a little bit, change the angle so we could see both root canals clearly separated. So the first thing we need to do is determine which direction the tube head moved. So this is the patient's right side. So we can imagine the tube head would be somewhere over here for this left image, and then somewhere over here for the right image. So from here to here, the tube head moved to the right. So once we figure that out, hold up your peace sign, put the two fingers in line with each other, your index finger now represents the buccal root canal that's closer to you, the tube head, and your middle finger represents the lingual root canal. Then move your head to the right, just like the tube head did between the two images. Which finger do you see to the left, and which one do you see to the right? The left one will be this blue arrow one, the right one will be this red arrow one. So the blue arrow points to the finger that was in the front or the buccal canal, and the red arrow points to the finger that was behind or the lingual canal. And another way to say it is that the red arrow root canal moved in the same direction as the tube head to the right, so same lingual opposite buckle. And that's the buckle object rule in a nutshell. And you can do this in any direction. If you move the tube head left or right, even up or down, you can do the same thing, just holding the peace sign horizontally instead of vertically. So hopefully that demystifies a seemingly complex idea in dental radi uh, radiology, but it's used all the time and is certainly super useful when used clinically. So thanks so much for watching everyone. That's it for this video. I hope you learned something about dental x-rays, how they work, and how you read them. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, David Jaden, and all of my patrons for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on, and practice questions for board exams in dentistry. So go check that out if you're interested, the link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.